Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning. My name's Mary Pearl, and I'm an al Anon trying to be happy, joyous, and free. <laughs> oh, as you can see, the Rose City Group is alive and well here today, and I'm a member in good standing of the Rose City uh, al Anon family groups, and I'm very, very grateful for all of y'all showing up today. Thank you very much. Uh, I do want to guarantee you that uh, you will have time to pee before uh, Matt speaks. <laughs> Tonight. <laughs> Some of us are sicker than others. Um, we're, uh, we are told to share from the, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous uh, uh, our experience, strength, and hope, and, and share a little of what we used to be like, what happened, and what we're like now. And uh, that's what I'm going to try to do for you this morning. Hopefully there will be a difference between the two. Uh, we'll see. You may not realize, but uh, I spoke here before on my 40th birthday. A very long time ago. <laughs> it's like I was talking to Clay and he said, and I told him, I said, I was speaking when you were a baby in diapers. <laughs> Chances are that's true. Uh, <laughs> but anyway... Uh, I am grateful to be here, and I want to thank the committee for having invited me. It's always a privilege to get to speak in front of a group of alcoholics or Al-Anons, because if it weren't for y'all, I wouldn't have the life that I have today. If y'all hadn't cared enough about me and J.D. to embrace us, this was the first uh, convention that we ever went to in 1977. 1977, and uh, I remember our feeling when we left that uh, that Sunday afternoon, and we looked at each other and we said, "God, we got to stay in this deal. We got to come back and we got to do this more because we were just overwhelmed." Uh, we had a tradition back then uh, that uh, on uh, Friday night they had the uh, talking chairs, and that was all the chairpersons. Remember when they used to do that? And then we would all go back to somebody's room, and we would have meetings all night long. And there was one particular gentleman that it seemed like uh, every year he got put in the room next to us. And he told me one night, he says, I have requested never to be in the room next to y'all. <laughs> he said, do you ever sleep? <laughs> and I thought, no. No. Not when you go to the convention because you're so excited and you're meeting everybody and you're having such a good time. Who needs to sleep? Well, now I understand. <laughs> I had Mary Pearl in the room next to me last night. and so, But I understand that exuberance and that feeling that we all had, and so that's, that's, that's no big deal. Um, to tell you a little bit about Mary Pearl, I was the youngest of four children. I'm a change-of-life baby, and I was a spoiled kid. I was the only one at home, and so I felt like I was an only child in a family of four. You know, there I was. Uh, my mother uh, was 41 when I was born. My daddy was 54, and so I was raised by old people in a world with older people. I never knew how much to relate to kids because I was never around that many kids when I was very small growing up, but I knew what to do to get the adults' attention. Uh, my daddy had retired from the military right after I was born, and he had uh, he was an officer for 38 years in the Army. And uh, he wanted to fish and hunt and raise bird dogs, and that's what he did, and I was right there with him, and I loved it. I was always a tomboy. I didn't enjoy being around my mother. My mother was not a happy camper. My mother was the untreated al -Anon. You know, if there's anything worse than being raised by an alcoholic, it would be being raised by an untreated Al-Anon. <laughs> Far more neurotic. If you think about it, an alcoholic gets a little relief every once in a while, you know? <laughs> they take a drink, they feel a little better. The Al-Anon takes bitterness. 
you know, they don't have any fun. It's, a, it's sort of like wearing a, a merit badge. You know, if they have fun, it doesn't count. Uh, <laughs> And so my mother was a very miserable lady, and Daddy and I escaped as often as possible. Now, an incident happened when I was five years old. It was going to have a dramatic impact on my life and that of many others, as it turned out. Uh, that particular fishing trip, J Daddy and I were going, and she announced she was going to ruin it and go with us. <laughs> now, my mother had rules about everything. She had rules, and she would tell you that fishing rules, my mother made everything a job. It seemed to her that if you weren't working, you had no worth. So my mother was the workaholic, and she was constantly working. And uh, so she made fishing a job. She said that she got to catch the first fish, the biggest fish, and the most fish. Other than that, you can fish. <laughs> well, I screwed up right off the bat. I caught the first fish. It was only about this long. But my mother gripped it off my hook, slapped it up on her paddle where she had marks, and she said, it's not a keeper, and with glee, threw it back in. <laughs> I went into a screaming coma right there in the boat. <laughs> my philosophy of fishing then and now is if it has eyes and a tail, string it. And Daddy said to her, he said, honey, or said to me, he said, honey, come back here in the back end of the boat with me. And so I went back to my daddy, and as I got close to him, he leaned over and said, and we'll get her. <laughs> I didn't know what it meant, but intuitively I knew I was going to like it. <laughs> and what it meant was every time she'd catch a fish, she'd swing around, he'd take the fish off, rebait her hook, and she'd swing around, start fishing, and he'd give me the fish. <laughs> And I'd throw it over. <laughs> Every fish the old heifer caught, I threw over. <laughs> now, Daddy's playing a joke on Mama, but the not little kid here, do you know what the little kid has realized this day? I have learned that when somebody does something to you and it hurts you, do it back to them as many times as you can. <laughs> and I found that out when I was doing a four-step. When I was writing all about my past and everything, and I was writing this down as one of my most pleasant childhood memories. <laughs> <laughs> but revenge was to be a way of life for me, and it was okay. I mean, that was the standard. That was the standard. Well, my whole life changed on November the 30th of, 19, of uh, 1954. I watched my daddy die of a heart attack that night, and uh, I was left with it. And uh, I called her the warden because I felt like I was in prison. And, and uh, my, whole, my whole world changed at that point. And I knew that everything I had been told about God and life and everything was all a lie. Because if God loved me, why didn't he take her and leave me with my daddy? And so I lost any kind of spiritual connection at that point in my life at the age of 12. And now I was going to do self-will run right until I got to y'all and sometimes afterwards. <laughs> you know, we don't get this overnight. And so anyway, I declared war on Mama, and I think she declared war on me. And the, and the, the bottom line was whoever dies first, the other wins. <laughs> Now, I'm an overachiever. I'm a straight-A student, and that's not good enough. I'm the straight-A-plus student, you know. I've got to be better than everybody else so that I can feel equal to the kid who's making a C. I don't know why, but that's just the way it was, and I always felt different. I never felt like I completely fit. Now, I led a gang of people because my, my thing is you either lead or you don't go because I can't afford to be at the mercy of someone else. You know, when you've got to manage and control things, you cannot be at the mercy of someone else. So therefore, you become the natural-born leader. Ha ha. And I had this group of little sickies that followed me. Some say I still do. <laughs> 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 but it's not a little group, and they're not re that really sick. <laughs> but anyway, um, in 1954, they did a wonderful thing for me. They built the or rather little 57, I think it was. They built the Air Force Base out at Little Rock. Actually, it was in Jacksonville. And I read in the newspaper that they said that there was 10 
men for every one woman in the area. And I want my 10. (laughs) And I want your 10 and your 10 and your 10. Is there ever too much of a good thing? No. If it feels good, do it to you. Die on the spot. You know? So as you can see at this point, I'm ready to drink, am I not? (laughs) It just doesn't do for for me what it did for a lot of y'all. But I had everything else in place, everything else. The only thing I can see between me and an alcoholic is a difference is an allergy to alcohol. And then when they drink, I have an allergy to their drinking, you know. (laughs) But anyway, this was going to be later on. Now, my mother's father, mother, two brothers and sister were drunks. My mother was the only one in her family that didn't drink. I think she needed one. (laughs) I think maybe, and she was always afraid of that. She told me, she said, we carry the bad seed, so don't ever drink. Because you see what happens. And her father was a very mean drunk. And she had many scars emotionally and physically from altercations with him until she was only 13 years of old age when she ran away from home. And so, therefore, I knew about alcohol, but I didn't know about alcohol. You know, it's real funny. You think you know and you live in the disease of alcoholism and you don't realize it is a disease and it's alcoholism. Never becomes alcoholism. It's always ism, you know, and the family carries that ism as well. You don't have to drink it to get sick on it. And so I'm living proof of that. Okay, I uh, went out to that air base, and I went trolling. And uh, <laughs> and sure enough, there's, there's sick ones everywhere, you know. And uh, I married this little old Yankee boy, and he never knew what hit him. You see, he said the magic words, I'll take you away from home. I would have gone with Satan himself if he had said, I'll take you away from home. Because I hated being there. I knew if I could get away from home, it was always, you ever notice how it was always going to be better over there? And when you get there, funny, isn't it? It's always better over there. And you know why? Because there, where you go, there you are. And I didn't know that. You know, there's so much you don't know, but you think you know everything. And when you think you know everything, nobody can tell you anything. And so, anyway, I married this little old Yankee boy, and he took me far away from home, which he promised. He took me to Newfoundland, (laughs) courtesy of the Air Force. And uh, I looked at that, and I thought, Newfoundland, Newfoundland, where is Newfoundland? I got out the atlas to even find where it was. I said, it's just this little dinky island off the coast of Canada, you know. And he said, well, that's where we're going, and it's called semi-remote. Well, God forbid you should ever go remote. (laughs) stepped off that airplane, I was in snow up to my butt. I had never seen anything like that before in my life. And I'm looking around, and there's some funny little strings in the backyard of our apartment. And I'm looking back there, and I said, what are those? He said, I don't have a clue. Come the fall, those are your clotheslines. Average snowfall, 290 inches a year. I'm telling you, it was a It was a shock for this kid. But more than anything else, I can tell you the one word that described Newfoundland to me was boring. I mean, how much snow can you watch fall? (laughs) The wind blows, the power goes off. You know, I mean, it wasn't at all like I thought it was going to be in this foreign country, you know. It wasn't foreign enough. And... Where did I find excitement? I found excitement in the clubs. And they had the Airmen's Club, and there was a couple of clubs down uh, on downtown, and then there was NCO Club and the Officers Club, and I thought, oh, my God, it's Mecca. And not only that, they had gambling machines in the clubs. And, I mean, I'm underage. You know, this is wonderful. You know, I'm just having a big time. And I got to trolling in the clubs because I had this problem with memory. <laughs> My husband played in the band, and while he played in the band, I worked the room. I'd forget I was married. (laughs) Because, you see, my drug of choice is adrenaline. (laughs) I'm addicted to excitement. If you don't have some, create some, for God's sake. And that's what I would do. You know, so 
Anyway, while I was there, I started to work for the American Red Cross as the assistant field director for Newfoundland and Labrador. Now, you think Newfoundland's bad. Labrador is a world all of its own up there with the Eskimos. And uh, I was, I, I call myself doing good. I really thought I was doing good. And, but my thing has always been I have to push the envelope no matter where, what I'm doing. I have to push those rules. I don't go with rules very well. And they had rules like you can't take liquor off the base on the Queen's Highway. And I would think, the hell I can't. <laughs> and so they would have these little inspections at the front gate all the time. They'd pull your car over to make sure that you weren't carrying any booze. But you see, I learned something really good when I was in school, and it said if you act like you know what you're doing, you can get away with just about anything. <laughs> and that's pretty much true. Because when the airmen, uh, the air police pulled me over that day, I had two giant sacks of booze in my car and so the guy says booze inspection I said just a minute I picked up my sacks I got out I said go right ahead <laughs> he inspected the car I put him back in got in drove off <laughs> don't you feel safe with military like that <laughs> My husband and I weren't getting along too well, needless to say. And, uh, but we stayed there. We extended and we stayed there for five years till right before they closed the base because it was good money. I was making good money when he was doing okay and uh, making rank. And so that, that's what we were doing. And then it came time to rotate back to the States. And so I remember calling the guy in stack assignment section. Now, hadn't I mentioned this to my husband? Absolutely not. Because I'm in charge. And so I asked the guy, the sergeant down there, and I asked him, I said, where are we supposed to go next? And he said, uh, my not North Dakota. <laughs> my not? I'm not. <laughs> I've been in ice and snow five years. I am not going to more ice and snow. That is not going to happen. He said, well, where do you want to go? <laughs> I said, well, I want to go back to Little Rock Air Force Base. Don't you know it's going to be all better back there now? Don't you know it's going to be? <laughs> Wouldn't be once I got there, but it was going to be. And he said, well, there's not an opening in your husband's career field. And I said, well, make one. I've always been a positive thinker. <laughs> and he said, well, I can't do that. And I said, well, then change his career field. He said, I can do that. <laughs> so a stroke of a pen, my husband, who was an aircraft mechanic, overnight became the head of a missile inspection team. <laughs> he had never seen a missile. And we got sent back to Little Rock Air Force Base, you know. They were a little excited about that, too. <laughs> anyway, you guess what? It wasn't working in Newfoundland. It ain't working in North Little Rock, either. It's just not working, you know. And so uh, after in a little, took them a couple of months, and they got that whole deal uh, straightened out. And they told him, oh, well, now you're going to go to Wichita, uh, Wichita, Kansas. I said, in the middle of the tornadoes? I don't think so. You know, I'm not going. And see, all I needed was just a little excuse because I didn't want to be married. I did not want to be married to him, especially. You know? And the bottom line was, though, I wasn't ready to be self-supporting through my own contributions. <laughs> now, I may be sick, but I'm not stupid. So... I convinced him with a little fast talking for slow thinking that he should go on and at some point or another we might get back together again. I got him out of the house and I put away all the stuff that was his and I said, free, free. I, I, was, like, I was like Martin Luther King, free at last, free at last. Praise God, I'm free. But I'm bored. <laughs> So I have to have a little excitement. Well, I noticed, you know, have you ever felt like that you were uh, a carrier? Because everywhere I go, there they are, you know. I feel like I carry that disease with me. And I noticed this guy across the street from me, and he would drink, and when he'd come home, he'd beat up his wife. Well, this is what my grandfather and my aunts and uncles always did, and so I was very familiar with that kind of behavior. And so it, it wasn't a big deal to me, but it was a big deal to the girl that was getting beat up. <laughs> And she was pregnant. And so he came home one night, and he beat her up, and she went into labor. And she came over to my house, and she asked me if I'd take her to the hospital. And I told her, sure. And I went back over to her house, and I walked in, and there he was laying on that bed, passed out with a little smirk on his face. And I looked at him, and I looked at her, 
And I thought, you know, somebody ought to whip his butt. And here's where I had a spiritual awakening. (laughs) I am somebody. (laughs) So I tied him up in his bed sheet. I took a sled out of the bed and I beat the fool out of him. (laughs) Just made you feel good all over, you know. Little did I know this is going to be the preview of coming attractions. <laughs> the next day he came over to my house and he said, uh, I was in a hell of a fight last night. <laughs> I said, I bet you were. <laughs> Told him his wife was in the hospital. He had a baby girl. On the other side of me, there was this guy and the doctor told Freeman, you are an alcoholic. You will have to quit drinking. Freeman quit drinking. That was it. No AA, no nothing. Freeman quit drinking. Now we get to see what irritable, restless, and discontent looks like next door. Because I'm always looking out. I'm always watching. And so I was a night person. Always have been a night person. And so I would get home around 6, 7 in the morning. And uh, he had a garden. And he wanted to till his garden at 8 in the morning. This is not acceptable. (laughs) This makes noise. This disturbs me. So I went out and I told him. He told me to shut my mouth and get my fat butt back in the house. He didn't know about Mama and the fish. (laughs) Now, Freeman had six beagles. If you've ever had one little beagle, you know you got a barking little dog. But he had a whole chorus out there. And I would wait till the wee hours of the morning. I'd run off my back porch with a broom. I'd run over there and take that broom handle, run up and down that dog yard fence, stir them into a complete frenzy, run, jump back on my porch and watch. (laughs) And he would come out in his underwear. He'd cuss them out, hose them down, and go back in the house. I'd wait about an hour and we'd do it one more time. Uh, The sheriff came to see me. (laughs) Have you ever noticed how law enforcement people are really, they they just don't understand when you're trying to explain things. (laughs) So I went into plan B. I got my daddy's frog gig and headlight. I mowed my grass at 1130 at night. (laughs) The sheriff came to see me. I had this Winchester 94 that I would shoot off like fireworks, and the sheriff came to see me. (laughs) And after a while, it occurred to me I had better find some other entertainment because the sheriff and I are beginning to develop a relationship. (laughs) It was that summer that uh, I had this wild birthday party, but in the meantime, I decided I would join. We had a neighborhood softball team, just your average neighborhood now back in the middle 60s, you know. And after the game, we would go back over to somebody's house and discuss our strategy for our next game. It was a mixed team, all different ages, just having fun. And some of them would be uh, popping a few tops, and some of them were snipping stuff. And others were, you know, out here. And then they had those with the sugar cubes. They were in a class all by themselves. (laughs) And just your normal neighborhood. And so they were all over at my house one night, and this little boy, he was about 18 years old, which wasn't legal to drink, and uh, he somehow got drunk at my house. And I got to thinking, now, if he gets picked up going home by the sheriff, uh, and he tells him where he got the booze, then I'm going to be in trouble here for contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Don't want that particular charge. And so um, I decided I'd drive him home and have somebody follow me and bring me back. Now, it sounds real simple, doesn't it? Well, we get out in his pickup, and in the sitting in the seat of the pickup is this china tea set. And I said to him, what is with the china tea set? He said, it's for my mom. I saw it and bought it for my mom. And I said, oh, and now he can't hardly walk. And I think, well, okay, I'll be helpful. I will carry this for him so he doesn't break the china tea set. And so here it is. It's 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm going into a strange house with a drunken 18-year-old kid, and I'm carrying a china tea set. Your everyday situation. (laughs) That did not seem bizarre to me because, you see, bizarre was my normal state, you know? And he goes in there, and he flips the light on his bedroom, and there's a man laying on the bed and nothing but his underwear. And he looks up and goes, Hot damn, little brother, you brought us a broad home. That was J.D. (laughs) 
Now, that doesn't seem like a strange way to meet your husband to me. <laughs> you know, I didn't figure I'd find him sitting in the front row of the choir, you know. <laughs> but anyway, that was earlier in the year, and then later I was having this four-day birthday party bash, and um, we got raided a couple of times. But, you know, J.D. came over. Roger told me he was the kid who got drunk. Roger came over, and he said, uh, my older brother, uh, can he come too? I said, oh, hell, who cares? The more the merrier. And so... Um, he thought I was too weird. He told his brother, he says, she's too weird for me. I don't know why he would say that. I mowed the grass, threw it in my house. My walls were painted black. I had nudes and the psychedelic lighting. I don't know why he thought I was weird. I had long black hair parted in the middle, sort of like Cher used to wear hers, you know, and I was doing vampire at the time. And I don't know why he thought I was weird. And I said, well, him and the horse he rode in on, and uh, who cares? Well, that party put me in the hospital, and uh, when I was sitting back home trying to recuperate, I called Roger, and I said, I'm out of cigarettes. And I said, would you go get me a carton of cigarettes and bring them? And so he came back with the cigarettes, and he had J.D. with him. And they came in, and I had music on, and I was making uh, Scarlet Ladies, and J.D. thought, heaven, you know. Because it was alcohol, and that was from the very beginning. You know, it was alcohol was a big part of our relationship. But the, the irony to that was we dated for four years. We had a wonderful, wonderful relationship, and then he ruined it. Now, during that period of time, yes, he got drunk several times, but he wasn't getting drunk in a, on a daily basis. And uh, when he would get drunk, he would break out in spots. <clears throat> New Orleans, St. Louis. He would just not show up, you know, for days at a time and then come back and act like he'd been gone for 15 minutes. It was amazing, you know. And after an hour, I would be assured that he had not been gone that long, you know. He was doing that fast talking for slow thinking stuff on me. And then he ruined it, though. He said, uh, I love you and I want to, uh, let's get married. Oops. You see, there's a time to tell stuff. And if you go past the time to tell stuff, there's not a good time to tell stuff. <laughs> and I said, well, I can't marry you. And he said, well, don't you love me? I said, it has nothing to do with it, really. And he said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, <laughs> I'm married. <laughs> he said, you're married? I said, I forgot, I forgot. <laughs> out of sight, out of mind, I forgot. He said, where's your husband? I said, Oh, I think he's in Vietnam or something. Maybe he'll get killed. You know? <laughs> then I'd get the, the big check and everything and still get back. You know, I mean, I'm still thinking along that line. And, uh, and so anyway, the amazing thing to me is he still wants to marry me. Does that tell you how sick he is? <laughs> Why would you marry somebody who can't remember they're married? You know? <laughs> A match made in heaven. Our best friends gave us six weeks. And by the grace of God, come November, be 41 years. Yeah. Well, you know, we got married on the 7th of November. We had a big party for Thanksgiving. I went into the bar that was fully stocked when J.D. moved in. And a uh, woman with a house. I, I got that. <laughs> And a job. <laughs> the things every alcoholic needs, right? Anyway, I had a fully stocked bar. I went in there to make drinks for the fact. We'd been robbed. He helped me look for it. Now, we had a German shepherd and a poodle. They don't drink. Where could it have gone? Was there any, any doors broken into? Any windows? No. But your mind doesn't want to go there. And now the disease of denial is fully alive in my house. I'm not going to see what I don't want to see. I'm not going to hear what I don't want to hear because I can't deal with it. If you don't like what you're seeing and hearing and you don't like what your only option is, you won't see and hear. You know, it's just like when the other women came in to the picture, you know. You don't see what you don't want to see. You don't hear what you don't want to hear. And therefore, you don't want to have to confront that deal. And so you begin, your world begins to get smaller and smaller. The disease of alcoholism is alive and well in our home. And then it became very imperative to me that he needed to be taught how to drink. 
I, well, he didn't know how to drink. I mean, it was obvious, you know, because he didn't drink right. Because I could drink tremendous volumes of alcohol, and so I quit drinking to show him how easy it was. <laughs> I'm here, you know. He's still drinking, and I don't understand that. And so I began to try to do all the things that we do in the sickness uh, from the Al-Anon standpoint. You try to reason with them. You tell them in 3,000 different ways the same thing. Trying to find the one that's going to register in the little brain now. (laughs) And violence enters our home. (laughs) Because now we have a relationship of a mother and a bad child. And so I would tell him what he could do, when he couldn't do it, what he could do, when, where, and how. And then he would go ahead and do his thing. That was unacceptable. He'd come home, and the war would ensue, and then I would have to put him out of my misery. (laughs) I got very sick doing that. And because, you see, there's something about when you hurt another one of God's kids, it comes back against you. You can't hurt other of God's kids and it not affect you spiritually at some level. And it was like I would, be, I would dare him. I'd say, hit me back, hit me back. And he'd say, my dad said, don't hit a woman. I thought it was a good thing. You hit me, I'll kill you. <laughs> but I wanted him to because if he did, then it would make me feel that what I had done was okay. And so what he would do, he would go out and get drunk, which I told him not to do, but he came home, took his whipping, and he felt everything was okay now. And so we did that one day at a time. (laughs) thing about it is J.D.'s drinking began to get closer and closer together and longer and longer and longer, and then he began to go to the jails. And the thing about it is when he gets drunk to a certain point, he gets a big mouth on him, and he would have to tell the police all about their parentage. And when he would do that... Sometimes they were not too kind to him, but they learned early on, and they say, we'll just take him to her. (laughs) She can do for us what we can't do for ourselves. (laughs) And after a while, you know, you just get to the point where you just, you can't function anymore. You know, in that revenge thing, J.D. decided, you know, he just had to have a sports car because he was hip, slick, and cool. I wanted a station wagon. We bought a truck. Nobody wanted that. <laughs> and he had to have that sports car. And now he, he got this little MG midget. Well, I was about double the size I am now. And so you can see it's not a car I get in and out of. It's a car I put on and take off. <laughs> And so I had this girlfriend who was very large as well, and I told him, I said, okay, now I'm going to the grocery store tomorrow to be sure and leave me the pickup. And instead, he thought, wouldn't it be funny to see both them getting in? It'd be like at the circus, getting all that out there. <laughs> so I got up that morning, I saw it, and it was in the wintertime, and I saw it, it was that little car, and I thought, okay, that's all right. I'll do this. He'll not stop me from doing what I want to do. And I had on my coat and everything. Well, I knew how to get in the car. You just can't bend low enough to get in the car when you're big and tall, and that's a teeny little car, I'm telling you. And so what I do is you just turn sideways and fall in. And once you fall in, then you got plenty of room for your feet, but you got to get in the thing first, and so I did. And so I was going through those gears as I was going over to her house, and she saw me from about a block away, or there's a school ground there, and she's standing on the front porch doing this. <laughs> and she said, I can't get in there. I said, yes, you can, and you will. I've always been a positive thinker. <laughs> and I explained to her how to get in the car. And so when she got in and fell in, the car sort of rocked a little bit, and I got her feet turned around, and I fell in on my side, and off we go. And every time I shift gears, she gets a spiritual experience. (laughs) Well, we get up to the grocery store parking lot, and I pull in, you know, now getting out is hard. If you think getting in something, getting out's worse. I never fell out of that car that I didn't get my feet hung in the steering wheel. I don't know how. But I did my normal thing, got my feet hung in the wheel, crawled out of the car, walked around. I told her, I said, come on. She said, I can't. I said, what do you mean you can't? She said, I'm stuck. I said, stuck? And she said, yeah. She said, my bucket's stuck in this. And I said, holy God, you're way over the bucket. What are you talking about? And so anyway, I had one foot on the door and one foot down here, and I'm jerking on her. You know, I'm going to get her out. And when she came loose, she came loose quick. And she fell on top of me, and we're rolling around out there on the parking lot. And this black guy's watching. 
and he's showing a lot of mercy. Call a fire department. I look over him. I said, you want your ass whipped? Now, I went in the store, and we bought groceries. Can you feature that? Where are you going to put the groceries? The trunk is like a glove compartment, you know. So we had stuff all in the floor, behind the seats. We had it all over. And we got all back in the car and started down, and we broke the axle. Now, (laughs) that night, J.D. comes in, and he says, where's little darling? I said, in a ditch over on Healy, or School Street. And he said, what happened? And I told him, he said, there's a 500-pound weight allowance on that car. And I said, who knew and who cared? You left it here? Not my problem. So we got in that big GMC pickup, and we went over there to retrieve little darling. And he had this piece of chain. He said, we'll just tow it home. I said, okay. So now he begins to give me instructions on how to tow. Now, I don't know about you, but I despise somebody trying to tell me how to do what I know how to do. My mother used to do that to me. You know, you'd be fishing, she'd tell you 15,000 times how to raise and lower the anchor till you wanted to stip it, you know. And so he began this thing, and I'm just listening. He's saying, now, it's in the wintertime, it's cold, and the automatic choke was on the big truck, and I figured there's enough power just to let you put off the brake, get that thing. I mean, it's just a little old dinky car anyway. And But he kept going on, and whatever you do, don't floorboard it. Now, I mean, what floorboard? What is the matter with him? So all I do is I take my foot off the brake, and sure enough, there was a lot of power on that. I mean, it slung him sideways out of that ditch. He went bing, bing over there and broke that chain, and he was just... (laughs) He was like a crazed person. He came up there, and he talked to me like no man should ever talk to his wife. And he accused me of floorboarding it. If you're going to carry a name, might as well play the game. And so I waited, and he got the chain, which is now shorter than it was a while ago. He's got that chain hooked on the back of that little car, on the back of that truck in front of that little car. And so this time, I floorboarded it. <laughs> well, that was exciting, you know. I mean, he just sort of was like Rick Rack, ricocheting from one side of the street to the other. And, and, and he came up there, and he was just, he couldn't even talk. He was just, <laughs> and I said, now that's what happens when you floorboard it. Do you see the difference? <laughs> The chain is now four foot long. He said, if you stop fast, I'm going to go up under the truck. (laughs) Well, is it plain to you? It is to me. I can't please him, so I just won't stop. (laughs) So I just went home without stopping. So what if it was a stop sign? So what if it was a red light? You just keep going, you know. And when I got him there, he was just absolutely hysterical. And he says, I'll never, I love the way he quivers when he gets mad. I'll never ask you to tell me again in the echoing corridors of time. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, you will. And when you do, I'm going to remember this day. <laughs> Three and a half years later, he called me. He's over at his mother's. The fuel pump's gone out on his little darling. He wants to know if I'll tow him home. I now have a big 12-passenger station wagon with a 450-horsepower engine. (laughs) Yes, I'll tow you home. (laughs) And I hung up that phone and went, (laughs) Oh, God, he's mine. He's mine. Every dog has her day. You just wait long enough. So I went over there and very calmly backed up, and I hooked on to that little bitty car. And when I'd look in my rearview mirror, I couldn't even see the front end of that car because he still had that four-foot piece of chain. (laughs) I could see the windshield in his eyes. It was enough. (laughs) And I took very calmly through the little streets to the main highway there going to Jacksonville, and I pulled out on that highway, and I went 80 miles an hour. (laughs) You could feel a little bit of a drag. (laughs) You could see smoke from his tires, you know. He wasn't stopping the big mama. She was on her right. And all of a sudden, I'm coming up, and there's three cars pass them all at one time. (laughs) Now, we laugh, and that's funny, but if that wouldn't have been funny if you'd been one of them three cars, I bet you. And it wasn't funny when I think about it in today because I could have killed all of us out there on that, but I was getting even. 
And that was the way that revenge was for me. That was the biggest adrenaline rush in the whole world, so it was going to be real hard to let go of. But anyway, the drinking, uh, finally, uh, I told him, I said, you're going to have to get out. And this time I meant it. And you know, there, there's many times you say it, but there's a time you mean it. And he said, well, I don't know why I do what I do. He said, I think I'm sick. And I said, that is the truth. You are sick, sick, sick. <laughs> and so I took him to the family doctor. Now the doctor knows what's wrong with me. I've been going to him for years with stomach problems, nerve problems, blood pressure problems, all that kind of stuff. Now the doctor knows what's wrong with me. And he tells J.D., he said, you know, we in the medical profession, we don't do much for alcoholics. He says, but there is a group of people called Alcoholics Anonymous, and they seem to help people like you more than we can. And J.D. said, I'm not an alcoholic. And I said, that's right, he's not. You see, we didn't know what alcoholism was. And J.D. said, I know I've got some friends who are taking this little drug called Anabuse. And if I had just a little help, I know I could I could do that deal. And so he left the doctor's office with the prescription. Actually, I had the prescription because I can't trust him. And uh, what I heard the doctor say was, if you give him this pill every day, he can't drink. That is not what the doctor said. But I heard what I wanted to hear. And so now we go into the year of the dry drunk. Now, J.D.'s not getting any treatment for alcoholism. Mary Pearl's not getting any treatment for the family disease of alcoholism either. And this is where I became the sickest. J.D. was irritable, restless, discontent. I was lethal. We could not we could not discuss anything. We couldn't sit down. We couldn't be in the same room together five minutes if we were not at one another. We were miserable. He would, I would say to him, what do you want for supper? And he would say anything. And I'd say, you want fried chicken? He'd say, no. I don't want fried chicken. What do you want? Anything. And I'd say, well, you want some spaghetti? No, I don't want spaghetti. You make the world's worst spaghetti, as a matter of fact. And I'd say, well, good. And then I'd fix something, and he'd look at it and say, you don't expect me to eat that, do you? And I'd say, well, you have a choice. You can eat it or you can wear it. (laughs) Sometimes he ate it. Sometimes he wore it. (laughs) It was not fun at our house, but it was that summer that the committee joined me. I was thinking all the time, thinking, plotting, planning. I am miserable. I had to get out of this. And so here is the conversation. Oh, I am so miserable. Me too. Well, why don't you get a divorce? We can't get a divorce. Why can't we get a divorce? Well, you've already divorced one. You know, and if you happen to be the common denominator, we're not going there. Okay. Well, what what about if you became a widow if he was to die? What was that? (laughs) That sounds good. And so, tell me more. And so we began to think about that. And I thought, oh, yeah, man, I, I want to take an ice pick, stab him in the neck, and watch him drip. <laughs> and then I said, well, why don't we buy, a, you know, right back over him with the car and just squish him up in the tread. Make a note, buy new tires. <laughs> I began to feel better. That was light at the end of the tunnel for me. You know, people who are crazy don't realize they're crazy. Now, can you see the importance of having a sponsor or someone to talk to? (laughs) I think somebody might have mentioned this was not a good plan, you know. (laughs) And went on that summer, you know, and it got worse and it got worse. And then finally I saw in the paper where a woman had killed her husband and she said that he was an alcoholic. And I thought, yes. But the jury found her guilty, and they sent her to prison, and I went, tacky, tacky. That would never have happened if I'd have been on that jury, I can guarantee you. (laughs) So that means now we have to have another meeting of all the Mary Pearls. We have to get together, and we get to thinking again. And that November, we came up with it. You know, if an alcoholic were to pass out and drown, who would know? Who would know? Well, he wasn't drinking, but intuitively you know he's going to drink again. He always does. And so sure enough, a year to the week, J.D. went on an abuse. J.D. got drunk. Now, how can he get drunk? I'm giving him the pill. It never occurred to me he could spit them out. I guess I thought they were like an aspirin. You put them in, they went, you know, or an Alka-Seltzer. I don't know. But anyway, uh, J.D. came home. Now, we had ice and snow in uh, Arkansas that year, and and J.D. came in, and um, I heard him before he ever got there. He was driving in second gear. 
car coming down the street. And then instead of coming in the driveway, he missed the driveway. He knocked off the cast iron hitching post holes that's in concrete. And he went across the yard sideways. He hit the tree and then bounced into the side of the brick house. I said, well, he can't drive on ice and snow. <laughs> but he opened the door of the truck and he poured out. I'd seen that too many times. I said, some bitch is drunk and I'll kill him if it's the last thing I ever do. <laughs> he opened the door. I never said anything, which is unusual because usually my mouth was wired to the door. <laughs> I just jerked that door and when he did, he sort of came this way. I whopped him one like that. He flipped and hit the coffee table and knocked himself out. <laughs> I drug him down the hall, down the living room, down across the hall, into the bathroom. Took his clothes off of him, ran the bathtub full of warm water, put him in, held him under. I want him dead. He is the problem. He's the problem. And then the voice comes in my head, which is not a committee member, and it says, you can't do this. Look at what you're doing. And I picked him up by the hair of the head, and I said, the hell I can't, and put him back down. <laughs> and he's there in the tub, and the voice came back and said, do you not realize this is murder? premeditated murder, you're taking the life of someone you once loved. No, it's like clarity all of a sudden. I've become an animal to fight an illness. I'm killing someone. If you told me I was capable of premeditated murder, I would have told you you were out of your mind. But here it was. God, I jerked him out of there. I drug him in there and I dried him off and I drug him into the bed. I even got the hair dryer down and dried his hair. I didn't want him to catch cold. <laughs> and thank God I had worked for the Red Cross because I could resuscitate him. <laughs> See, God always gives you what you need. <laughs> and then I shut the door on that room and I went in the living room and I rocked for the next 10, 12 hours with a desperation I had never known before in my life. I knew I could not live like this anymore. And I didn't know how not to live like this anymore. And uh, I got up the next day and I went off to work as if nothing had happened. How can we do that? How can we do that? You know, we can compartmentalize stuff and you go on. But I would sit at my desk and I was like a zombie, like a zombie. You know, I didn't know what to do. And I came home from work one day several days. J.D. liked to die in that room. You see, he would beg for help and scream and holler and everything, but I had seen him go through DTs before, and so it never occurred to me that he might be in real trouble. But he knocked a hemorrhage to death in that room. J.D. had alcoholic poisoning. So it's only by the grace of a merciful God that he's alive and I'm not in prison somewhere. You know, it wasn't, I mean, he had drank too much in a short period of time and his body had lost the ability to pass out. And so he had really overdosed with the alcohol. And uh, anyway, I came in and he told me, he said, um, I need to call that number. I've been trying to call it all day long. And I said, what number? He said, that Alcoholics Anonymous number. You see, the doctor had given us the phone number for a central office. And so I made that call, and there was a lady that answered, and she used to be a chairman of this convention. Her name was Mary Peeler. She's in that big meeting, and she said, there's a meeting in one hour's time, six blocks away from where you live. And I said, really? And she said, yes, that little rock building. I said, I know that little rock building. It was built by my grandfather who died of alcoholism. And so I took J.D. over there for his first meeting. And thank God there was an old guy there, believe an old-timey AA, and he, he signed himself as J.D. sponsor. The minute he walked in that door, he said, boy, I'm going to sponsor you. I was not thrilled. He looked worse than Grandpa when we buried him. <laughs> And they told me, there's Al-Anon over there in the corner. There was two ladies. And he said, uh, that's for you. And I thought, there's nothing wrong with me. <laughs> nothing wrong with me. And so there's nothing worse than somebody getting better in your home and it's not you. Because J.D. was going to meetings every day, two or three a day, everywhere he was going. Dura was taking him all over Pulaski County, showing him all the different meetings, introducing him to everybody. And, uh, and then J.D. went to the Serenity House. And um, 
He was he was completely nutty as a fruitcake by then. And the counselors told me that they didn't know. They thought he might have too much brain damage. They may have been right, J.D. <laughs> But anyway, uh, finally one night, uh, he uh, and this sponsor of his didn't come back after the meeting. And I knew they were both out drunk. And instead, they had been on a 12-step call. But during that period of time, the al those two al were sending pamphlets by way of J.D. to my home. And I don't know why I didn't throw them away. You know, those God deals that just happened. I had them in the desk. And that night when he didn't come home, I began to read. And it was like someone was looking in the windows of my soul. And so I called. There was a card in there. It says, my name's Earlene, if you ever need to talk. So I called. It's 1130 at night. Earlene, I need to talk. And she was very, very kind about it. She told me there was an al meeting, and I told her if I ever got that bad, I would come. <laughs> and J.D. got sober, and J.D. got fired. And I said, like, well, wasn't that a wonderful thing? You know, but I know it was. You see, J.D. had asked God to keep him sober and so he could drink on the job. So God removed him from his playground and his playmates so that he could have a chance. But that was what also pushed me over the edge because I was so into material things that all of a sudden my material things were threatened. And that scared me enough. So I went to one of those meetings. And I wanted to know, how do you keep an alcoholic sober? And how do you manage when there's nothing left to manage? And they told me, we don't know. And I wept. You know, I mean, I've come to you people for God's sake. But then they began to share with me. That's one thing that we can do. They share. And, you know, I could relate to them. And I kept coming back. And I asked myself later, why did I keep going back to those meetings? Because for that one hour, I felt safe. For that one hour, I felt like maybe somebody cared when I didn't really care myself. I could. How could anyone else like me or love me? I didn't. And if you knew me, you wouldn't love me either. And so I was so afraid for a very long time to really be who I was. So I just went until one night there was a little old lady, and she was from uh, over in Oklahoma. And she and her husband, he had been sober since the first 100. And, and he would come to the meetings and... Um, she would say, you know, we lived in this apartment, and I'd stretch this string across the top step and hope he'd fall and break his damn neck. <laughs> and I thought, I love her. <laughs> you see, when we share those dark corners of us, it gives you permission to tell the truth about your deal, you know? and to know that you can get better because they got better. That's the whole deal. And, you know, I got that sponsor. I got a sponsor I didn't want, but I still got that sponsor after 33, almost 34 years. And there's nobody in the world loves me better than my sponsor because I know she loves me. Even knowing all that crap, she loves me. Where do you ever find people like that, you know? It's my family of choice. I only have one living a relative left, and that's my sister, you know. And she's in a nursing home because 45 years to the day I watched my daddy die, I watched my sister die in the front seat of my car with me. And uh, she had kidney failure, and it threw her heart in a bad rhythm, and it stopped. And they brought her back after 12 minutes, and they did not bring back my sister. And it's been a very difficult 11 years being having to have the responsibility of taking care of someone. You know, we think we want to handle everything and manage and control. Well, when that's your job, it's a whole different ball of wax, people, a very different one. But anyway, I kept coming to those meetings and doing what my sponsor said and working the steps in my life. And uh, it was amazing to me how my thinking began to change, my reactions began to change. And not only that, here was the woman who could never have any children. And all of a sudden, I began to have children of the Spirit. Those children that they would come and ask me, would you sponsor me? You know, I wasn't anyone that was going to be able to deal with the little kids. Even to, you know, like yesterday, one of them tried to assassinate me twice out here in the hall. <laughs> Get a hold of your children. <laughs> but the bottom line was, I've got my kids and a bunch of my kids and my grandkids and my great-grandkids and my great-grandkids are here today. And I'm very, very grateful. 
the worst relationship in my life was that with my mother. It wasn't with J.D., you know. And we found out after about five years of him being sober and me working Alan on that if we'd used those traditions in our home, our relationship might have a chance of getting better. And over the years, by doing that, like I said, you don't think we've been together for 41 years and hadn't had some good time, you know. And I tell you, J.D. said to me when he asked me to marry him, he said, come grow, grow old with me. Well, here about 10 years ago, I looked at him and said, what next? <laughs> but these have been the sweetest years of our life. These are the things that you don't, you got to have more going for you than just sex, people. If you're going to be there for the long haul, you got to have more than just sex. Anyway, that relationship with my mother, I said, I hate her. And, uh, and you know, that was the first time I'd ever said it out loud was in an Al-9 meeting. I said, I hate my mother. And several of them said, yeah. <laughs> because, you know, when I was growing up, it wasn't socially acceptable to say you hated your mother because that made you a bad person. Well, you know, nowadays everybody does, I hate my mother. You know, it's not a big deal. But it's just like, you know, everybody, you know, used to when I was growing up, you had to be married to get pregnant. <laughs> oh, well, forget that. <laughs> Times have changed. But, like I say, when I came into Al-Anon, when, they, and they, when I heard that, it's like, really? And it's like a lot of people have had. But when you become ready, when the student is ready, the teachers will appear. And there was this girl came down from Missouri to visit our group. And her name was Betty. And she said, I've worked through a lot of problems with my mother. And she said, I'd be glad to share with you. And the first thing she told me to do, piss me off. I didn't want to do it. You see, I wanted my mother to change and be the way I wanted my mother to be. And she said, no, you have to accept your mother just like she is. Because if she could be any different, she would have been different. She doesn't have a program like you to teach her how to change. Well, we can do something with that. She said, no, we're going to leave her alone and we're going to work on you. And you have to accept her like she is. And so going over the bridge that night, we had met at 1.20 and a half that night, and going over the bridge into the, from the Little Rock to North Little Rock, over the freeway bridge, I said, God, be my mama. I'm giving her to you, and I'm going to ask you to provide for me the mother that I've always wanted because I can't get it from her. And God told me, your sister's been your mother. My older sister, Dorothy, who was 16 years old when I was born, had been the kind of mother I had always wanted because she was kind and loving and generous and very forgiving and all of those things. And she never made fun of me. Mother did. And all those things. And I realized my sister had been that kind of mother I wanted all my life, and I never gave her credit for it because, see, I was looking at somebody else to do it. Not finding it over there, it wasn't there. See, God always has what you need if you're looking for it and not putting boundaries on how God gets it to you. Don't put God in a box. And so I went on and I began to do the things they told me to do. Like, the, you know, Mother's Day, is that not a trauma? You've got to find a card that says something you don't mean. <laughs> Can't they just make one that says, Happy Mother's Day, bitch? <laughs> that I had sent her before I started working on this, it says, the longer you bitch, the longer God lets you live. It was one of those little Maxine cards. Mother was in her 80s. She was not appreciative of that card. So I, the first card I bought, it was all I could do to write Mary Pearl on it. And I said, I just can't send it. I just can't send it. My sponsor sent it for me. And she said, you'll do better next time. And I kept doing those things. But you've got to be consistent. And just because you make a few changes, you've got to give it time. Because, you know, it's just like when the alcoholic was drinking. They go sober a little while, but then when they come back and drink again, then it's all gone again. Well, see, I couldn't keep my mouth shut. Because I'd be around my mama, and I'd have to tell her. And so my sponsor said, when you feel like you've got to tell her, go home. I might be there five minutes. See ya. 
my mother would call on the telephone, and I would go, God, it's her. And I'd say, Mama, i got to go to the bathroom. I hang on. And I'd go in the bathroom, and I'd get on my knees, like, God, it's her. You know, and my mama, one time she said, have you got a bladder problem? Because every time I call, you got to go pee. I said, yeah, that's how it works. That's what I got to do. But I kept on doing that. And then Betty gave me the, the keys to the kingdom. She said, ask God to see your mother like he sees her. Ask God to see that person in your life that's just driving you nuts to see them as God sees them. Because, you know, God sees us as all of his kids. He sees us the way he created us. He sees us in love because God is love. Just as God loves me, imperfect though I may be, God loves me anyway. And God accepts me the way I am. And so I was told to see my mother, and I prayed that prayer, and I finally told my sponsor, I said, how long do I have to pray this damn prayer? I've played for several years now. <laughs> she said, oh, till it works. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then one fall, I'm driving over at my mom's. She has a real long driveway, and she was out in the back raking leaves. And I looked back there, and I said, my God, my mama's short. Now, that sounds stupid, doesn't it? My mama came up to hear on me. Why did I not know mama was short? And the voice said, because you always come as a little child wanting from your mama. You never come as an adult. You always come wanting. You never go taking her anything. You come want. See, I wanted my mother to approve of me. I wanted my mother to love me just like I was. I wanted my mother to, all those things that I wanted from my mother, I was learning how to do for her. But I wanted them from her. And God was telling me, you know, you come as a little child going, gimme, 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 gimme. And when you're little, mama's big. That's the reason I had never realized mama was so small and so short. And so I'm just going, oh, my God. And as I'm walking back to her, it's like God let me see the inside of my mother's heart. And see, I always felt my mother had all this love that she was holding and punishing me by withholding it. And I didn't see that love. I saw scars. I saw hurt. I saw disappointments. I saw tragedies I did not see. And how can you give what you ain't got? You know, we learn in here, you can't transmit what you don't have. And so I just was just, oh, I was overcome. When I got back there, I realized if somebody was going to have to bring love into our relationship, it was going to have to be me. I was going to have to bring to her the love because she didn't have it. And I asked her to put down her leaf broom, and I gave my mother a hug like I would one of y'all. And my mother was stiff as a poker because you don't touch, you don't talk, we don't do any of those things. But, you know, I needed to do it for me. And then every time I would go to see my mother, which was like about every day or two, I would make a point to touch her or to give her the hug or be kind in some way to her to show that love. And, you know, over a period of time, that kind of deal makes a difference because then I didn't dread to go over there so much because for the first time, you know, it's like life's a potluck. What are you bringing? And I was bringing something to Mama's instead of asking Mama for something. I gave that up. I gave that to God. And then one day my Mama called me and wanted me to come by to see her. And I thought, okay. And so I went by to see Mama. And Mama said, I want to ask you something. How come it is when your daddy died you became such a rotten, ornery kid? And I said, well, I was getting even with you for not loving me. And she said, what do you mean I didn't love you? I gave you a roof over your head. I gave you clothes to wear. I gave you food to eat. It was more than I ever had. You see, my mother had been raised in alcoholism where her mother and her father both drank. Her father was a brutally mean alcoholic. He'd come in. He had cut her all over her body with a knife. He exposed himself to her on a regular basis. And when she was 13, he tried to rape her. She hit him in the head with a stick of stove wood and ran away from home and lived in a box in an alleyway in Memphis, hundreds of miles away. She stole food out of gardens and walked the whole way to get away for safety. 
the boarding house that was on this alley, the lady that was uh, the owner, was pregnant. And she told Mama she'd give her room and board if she would come in and help her in the boarding house. My daddy was the head of the uh, Army recruiting office in Memphis. He took his meals in that boarding house. And that was where they met. And when she became 16, they got married in the parlor of that boarding house. She had to give the best she could. Because if you had lived like that, what would be the greatest gift you could ever give your child? Never to worry about food, never to worry about something to wear, never worry about a roof over your head. And she had provided those things that I considered what everybody is supposed to do. But you see, she didn't have those things. Those were luxuries to her. And you know something? That day they became enough. And my mama looked at me and I looked at her and I said, Mama, what can I do to make it up to you for all the things, the hurts and things that I have done over these years that hurt you, so many of them on purpose? What can I do now to make that up to you? I was so wrong. And my mama looked at me and she said, Forgive me for not being the kind of mama you needed. And I said, Mama, I forgive you. My mama got up off of her bench. She walked across the room. She gave me the hug. And she said, baby, I love you. I've always loved you. The first time I ever heard her say it. That was a miracle. The hole inside of me that I'd had all my life closed up that day. That doesn't mean our relationship was perfect from then on. But it was never, I was never to have those feelings that I had had. That was Gone and done. Those were healed over. God did for us. And the steps and the people working and encouraging me and my sponsor, doing the deal, you get the results. That's my experience. Well, the deal with my sister, like I say, has come along. And um, I'm getting to do things that I never dreamed I would have to do for my sister. Because like I say, my sister was like a mother to me. When my mother died, I was totally okay. And I was always okay with Dorothy. Dorothy and I never had a problem with relationship. I remember one time she went with me to hear me speak, and she said, how come you never mention me in your talk? (laughs) You know, it's always all about us, you know. And I said, well, because I never had anything to have to change with that. I said, we always had a good relationship. And so now she gave me something to talk about her, you know. And it's been very difficult. It's been a difficult thing uh, to deal with it. But you know, God gives you what you need. And I have had a very, very difficult year this year in uh, the nursing home that Dorothy was in. Uh, It used to be the best one in the state. It is not anymore. And uh, the care she's been getting there hasn't been very good. And I've had to constantly, it's been like a, a complete nightmare. I get a call every day or two with some other tragedy. And, uh, but God sent an angel in my group. And he is offered, he's a nurse practitioner, and he is offered to help me deal with my sister. And I'll be forever grateful for that. And because of that, I can be here today and not have to worry if they're going to call me to come down there and she's being rushed to the hospital or whatever for something. And uh, so, you know, the thing about it is, just because you're in the program doesn't mean you're bulletproof. Life is going to continue to happen. But if I didn't have my home group and if I didn't have my sponsor in these 12 steps and a power greater than myself, I could not do the deal I'm doing today. And that's a fact. I have been so blessed. Uh, God knew that in 2000 I was going to have to go back to work. And... uh a girl that I had told her I would help her while one of her employee was out sick, uh, she called me and she said, would you like to go to work for me? Because I was wondering who was going to want an old broad, you know. Not one of those little cutesies, you know. Hello. You know. <laughs> Instead of law firm, Miss Thompson, you know. And uh, I celebrated my 10th year with her the first of this month. And the, the irony to this is on my 40th birthday, Like I say, I spoke right here, but my health is declining. I have arthritis very badly, and it's getting very, very painful to stand and talk for long periods of time or sit or do anything for long periods of time. Sorry, J.D. Uh, (laughs) It is what it is. And so... 
This will probably be the last time I will speak at one of the AA conferences here in Arkansas. And I just want you to know that it has been a wonderful opportunity. It's been a wonderful ride. I continue to come to meetings. Don't think I'm not. But it's just like I say, it's difficult to stand for long periods of time. And I thank you so much for your attentiveness. I love each and every one of you. And I'm going to close with my favorite poem. It's called The Weaver. My life is but a weaving between my God and me. I do not choose the colors, but he worketh steadily. Oft times in sorrow, sometimes foolish pride, I forget he sees the top while I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttle cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and explain the reasons why. But the dark threads are as needful In the weaver's hand is the threads of gold and silver in the pattern God has planned. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.